I'm Megan Santa Deutsch, author of Urban Fantasy and Urban Fantasy Romance Why Choose Editions. If you're new to my book, start with the first book in my Dowser series, Cupcakes, Trinkets, and Other Deadly Magic. And I just released Grand uh, Romantic Delusions. I wrote my title down wrong. So <laughs> I'm reading off the wrong title. All right. Uh, and I just released uh, Grand Romantic Delusions and the Madness of Mirth Part 1, which is set in my new Conduit World universe. I am exceptionally pleased uh, that one of my favorite paranormal romance authors, Maria Vale, has agreed to be a guest on A Conversation and a Hot Chocolate. And we're specifically discussing the first book in her Legends of All Wolves series, The Last Wolf. Maria Vale is a logophile, and you're going to correct me if I said that wrong, and a bibliovore, and a worrier about the world. Trained as a medievalist, she tries to shoehorn dead languages into things that don't really need them. She lives in New York with her husband, two kids, and a long line of dead plants. No one will let her have a pet. Her first book, The Last Wolf, was chosen by Library Journal and Amazon as best book of 2018 and was a Rita finalist in the Paranormal Romance and Best Debut categories. And I am not surprised in the least. Hi, Maria. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me here. And thank you. Can I do a shout out for Haley, who went ahead and smoothed the edges before I came here last <laughs> month? So smooth, so smooth now. <laughs> it's very smooth here. That's okay. That's all right. We're, we're not trying to be smooth. <laughs> we're just trying to enjoy books, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, here we go. Let's just start first thing, because it's me. Uh, we don't know each other very well, but, but you'll know this about me. Let's talk about yeah, our treat. Let's talk about our treat. So um, I've got a uh, dark hot chocolate, dark chocolate hot chocolate uh, made with Valrona chocolate and a touch of cream in my mug and a couple of squares. Now, I should really actually pay attention to where the camera is of my um, marshmallow fudge. The recipe is in MCD's Favorite Things Cookbook, free to download off my website or newsletter. And Maria, what treats have you brought to fortify yourself with this afternoon? so pathetic because it's two o'clock. I just had lunch and I can't really, um, I can't really eat too much sugar. Um, and because it's summertime, I lived, uh, many summers with my great grandparents on a farm, and I would take my treats were always green beans from their field, and I don't know to this day nothing says summer treat to me like green fresh beans. green beans. Oh man! Oh my goodness! Childhood memories for sure. Pulling carrots right out of the yeah. soil, and yeah. like they just have that the perfect taste. And of course, peas. Like oh, just okay. sitting there in in the garden, just eating peas. Right, spring in the home. I love it. I love it. I, yeah, we we, uh, we didn't grow up with much money. I mean, we didn't grow up in it with anybody. So this kind of treating thing is a very adult thing for me to do. And and uh, and certainly, yeah, foraging for fresh fruit this time of year. And I still have. I'm still obsessive about like Italian food plums. I don't know if that's a thing in your part of the world, but here on the West Coast, they 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 grow quite well, and they pick them off. You know, wait until they're the perfect ripeness and pick them off the tree. And just as kids, like out, you know, Gen X, out past, you know, <laughs> our parents had no idea where we were <laughs> eating the fruit off the trees, right? You know. <laughs> Well, like, they, they have fig trees. I, you know, we're in California for two months, and um, they have fig trees around, which are just sort of out there, and they smell so delicious. I've had figs straight from the tree. I have not yet figured out what they look like when they're ripe here, because they don't look quite the same as they do in Italy when they're ripe. Um, but that is just one of the most glorious things that you can have. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. And you must get citrus. You must be getting some citrus out there right now. Oh, no, maybe it's not the right time of year. No, no. In, in the backyard, again, this is somebody, a friend's house. So, you know, we're not, this is not our house, but um, <laughs> it's got these beautiful looking lemons. So I'm, I'm... Decadent, decadent. All right. 
So let's us get to know each other with a quick and dirty uh, round of Maria's favorite things, uh, and, and feel free to elaborate. Uh, otherwise, I'll just I'll just feel okay. We're just going to do ten because because sometimes I I can go on a little bit about favorite things. <laughs> so, um, Maria, favorite book and or series. I love 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 Terry Pratchett's Discworld. Um, but I have a very specific sub part of that, which is the Tiffany Aching books. It starts wow. with We Three Men. And they are, and my, my goal in this life is to make sure that every woman reads the Tiffany Aching books. She's, you know, she's a kid, she's 12 or whatever she is, but she's so wise and she's so funny and she's so sensible and down to earth and she makes the best cheese and she's my heroine in this world. So I, that is, that is my favorite series. Yeah. My entry point to, to Terry Pratchett, which was silly at the time, but because of course he had had so many books out at that point was sorry. And I'm going to say Wintersmith. It's right, which is, I think like the third or fourth of the Tiffany Aching. So you're not yeah. in within a sort of sub part, but the fourth part. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. And I loved it. I went back, of course, and read all the rest of the Tiffany Aching books. And then I went back through and he was he had such a vast amount of books that I went back through and I figured out which ones were witches at the time. And I read every single witch book because of course it led up into Tiffany. But I have to say his final book that was brought out um, after he passed away and his son, I think, had helped finish it. One of his children. One of his children right, had helped finish it. And sorry, I'm mixing up... Uh, I'm making up dead literary geniuses. I'm um, sorry. Uh, it's a different son with a different literary genius that helped finish uh, one of his pieces. Um, so, uh, and I have to say, I I swear I didn't even get a couple of chapters into that final book and I had to put it away. I was so devastated. I don't want to ruin anything for spoilers, but it was also reading him after he had passed away. I don't know. I just couldn't do it. I'm going to have to pick up that book again. I mean, final yeah. book. The final Tiffany Aching uh, right. book right. was, right. I was just like, I can't do this. I was just right. blubbering for the whole thing. <laughs> okay. Well, this is not a very quick game of favorite things, but that's okay. That's how it's <laughs> so. This is what happens when you, you know, when you have two people who are passionate about a thing and they've both read it. So that's true. That's true. So favorite author was going to be the next one. Not um, sure if you want <laughs> You know, that one is really, really hard because there are certain authors who I, like, I adore one book. Vasily Grossman's Life and Death is is one of the greatest books I've ever, ever read. Um, it is not, it's a book I've read twice and I will never read again because I'm just too old. It's, it's about life during World War II. But would I say he's my favorite author? You know, that's a book I adore. That's true. Wonderful. Something that hit you in a certain way. Yeah. yeah. A certain moment, certain, I don't know, you know, um, there are so many people, you know, just in our genre. I love Grace Draven and Jeffy Kennedy and Amanda Boucher and, um, and I love the Mercy Tompkins books and, uh, and, uh, there are so many of them. There of course. So yeah. And so those are. Those it's are, a hard question. I'm not going to, I'm not going to say it. I'm just. Okay. Not gonna... <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's fine. All right. Uh, how about something less controversial? We'll say, what's your favorite food? Cheese. <laughs> every, every kind of cheese, except for toast. I don't know how to pronounce it, but if you're Swedish, there's this sweet brown cheese. And I find that so unspeakably disgusting. And I'm sorry, Sweden. I hope you do well on the Olympics. Please don't hate me, but get toast is <laughs> misery. Okay. okay. And then favorite dessert then? Picking cheese for your food. <laughs> uh, favorite dessert is a panna cotta. So, you know, it's thick and it's 
very creamy, but not exceptionally sweet. And especially if it has a little um, passion fruit on top. Oh, nice. Lovely, lovely. Uh, sticking with that theme, your favorite joint. What must you have on you? My favorite what? Drink. Oh, um, well, I mean, coffee, yes, because I don't actually operate if I don't have coffee, coffee but um, I like beer. So I, I drink beer, not a lot, because I fall asleep immediately. And so to correct that, I have to have iced tea. So there's the caffeine beer just to sort of level me out. To, <laughs> right. to counterbalance each right, other. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. That works. <laughs> um, what favorite, what's a favorite TV show or what are you indulging in right now TV wise? Okay, my favorite TV show, there were a couple of shows weirdly that again I, I don't mean to go back to COVID, but there were a couple of things that really stuck in my mind because in a way i think we were all watching tv in a way that we hadn't necessarily before one of them was a show called repair shop which was about this little shop in britain where they repaired things that were of emotional significance not you know fancy stuff but it's like your old teddy bear or a watch that wasn't expensive, but had belonged to your great grandfather. And it went through all of this process of repairing it. And somehow there was something about that, this repairing, it's a little bit like the Great British Baking Show. You know, you have this cast of characters that you absolutely adore, um, but, it, but it was about repairing and making things right again. And that was- oh, I love that. There's another show called that nobody's ever watched, but was the best show I have ever seen in my life. And it's called The Detectorists. And it has in it, I at some point decided that I don't have the RAM for actors' names. So my husband and I are, it's always the guy with the wood eyeball in um, Pirates of the Caribbean. So that's one of them. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other one is a really great actor who played. Um, I, he's played in all. He's been in Sherlock. He's been in all these other things. But this is about metal detectors in Britain looking for these, these slightly hapless guys looking for a great treasure that will teach them about history, and it's it is the most beautiful show i think it only went i think it was three seasons and maybe only six episodes a season so oh, everyone great. like we'll everyone all be watch this and read tiffany aching and i will die happily thank you <laughs> <laughs> um and along the same lines do you have a favorite movie i have the worst taste in movies so all the movies that i like are movies that nobody else likes I loved Apollo 13. I loved the big short. And I loved a movie called uh, The Big Year, which was about birding. It had Steve Martin and Jack Black, but nobody has ever seen it. And oh it's my God. Lovely. And it's about birding. Oh, I love those two actors. And I like birds as well. <laughs> so, well, I work full um, time. And I, I volunteer at a, at a bird rehab place so that's very cool that's further down on my on my list of things. there you go um so uh what's your favorite thing to do outside of writing um a hobby or or you know i have no no diy skills at all i mean not a single one um and mostly i like to explore the places where i am so in New York, I'm very lucky because there's a density of places to go. And, you know, you wander around and you're, it's like you find out that two blocks down from you is where Miles Davis lived. And I, I'm a historian, so I find these these tiny traces of history super interesting. Very intriguing. Yeah, yeah. Love that. Love that indulgence we don't have that as much here up on in canada on the west coast we're very young right very right. very young we were settled last 
yeah. uh, or one of the last, I guess I shouldn't exaggerate, but, uh, but, um, and, and so like anytime we travel East even, uh, or, or especially to Europe, we're always like, <laughs> Right. <laughs> oh my god right how old is that hell is like you know right so uh we, we we have other natural beauty and everything and i'm not i'm not sneering at it but it is it, it, you're right that every day you know walking down the street experience is very different on the two on the two coasts i mean you would find that in california where you are right now compared to new york as well right okay and what's your fuel like what feeds your creativity um, reading books, I have to say, I, you know, I think I like to, I find that social media saps it <laughs> because it's, you know, it requires something of you, but gives very little back, at least in my mind, the opposite is true <clears throat> of reading. So you read, you know, you read a good book and you're sort of like, that is fantastic. That's what I want to be doing. That is making me, that is refueling my tank. Exactly. And, yeah. and so reading, reading great books is just, and the books that, you know, sometimes it's like, it, it can be such a minor thing. It can be a way of looking, you know, like a hero and a heroine look at each other in a way that, you know, often that's a kind of throwaway scene. You have, you've seen it a zillion times, you don't pay any attention. And suddenly you're reading it and you're saying, yes, that's right. That feels true. There's a, you know, there's a sort of literary thing of thisness where it feels very specific to a person it feels very specific to a situation. It's not just let me run through this scene and get through it. And he looks at her warmly. You know, that doesn't tell you anything. But you'll and so just this beat and this beat, this beat, the and in between those moments. Makes yeah. sense and it and it feels unique. So yeah, yeah I I love reading that's that's perfect good fuel good fuel for uh, for creativity 100 <laughs> and then we you kind of touched on this before but what's your favorite charity or cause because of course you follow you for any time on your social media and 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 i'm in love all those posts but but you know obviously wolves are very important to you and uh and, uh, and animals in general uh, right so what, what what would be your favorite cause um or right charity? Now, i have so i i wrote five books in the legend of all wolves. And then I did for an anthology, a novella called, um, wonderland. Um, and that all proceeds from the sale of wonderland go to the wolf conservation center in upstate New York. And, uh, I, I love that place. I went there with my younger kiddo and we camped out there in a tent one of the coldest evenings I've ever spent in July. Um, and uh, then I, so I decided that I would have all the proceeds from Wonderland go to the Wolf Conservation Center. That's it. That's amazing. I know. I think I, I told you to up the price on that one. I saw you were, what you were pricing it at. I was like, this is for charity. I think you should up it a little bit. Not that you know who I am or why I'm buddying with you. <laughs> and you, are, you, are a, you are a wise person in this, in this journey of ours, you know, <laughs> I, I am, I am so impressed by what you're able to do. Oh no, just we try, all try our best. Don't we? It's just crazy, but we all have different skill sets uh, and everything, but um Let's talk about the last wolf for a second. I'm, I'm going to get my gushing out of the way all in one, all in one go. Okay. <laughs> I actually had to write down my thoughts here so that I was somewhat articulate. And even then I don't think it's very articulate. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let me get the book, <laughs> the book too would probably be, uh, be good. This is the book we're talking about, but it's the entire series, uh, I adore the entire entire series, um, but I am especially in love with with uh, this book and um, and the uh, we shouldn't pick favorites, but and the uh, second to last book in the series too holds a big. Uh, I think you know we always just certain characters that really just sort of speak to us and and um, anyway. So we're talking about the last wolf, 
Um, so while rereading re The Last Wolf for the third time in, in prep for our conversation, um, I was struck, I think sometimes when you reread and you're not just gobbling it all, it all up for the, for the amazing story, um, I was struck by the subtly, subtlety woven throughout your writing. So you have this intriguing way of layering contrasting elements within your story uh, that results in like this terribly unique perspective that's like, it's almost masquerading as a paranormal romance, um, which is, I'm not dissing on paranormal romance, but like there's, like, I feel like, oh, I'm getting all, I'm gushing on you now. I feel like this is sort of like this elevated version if I'm going to be a complete snob of uh, paranormal romance. And, and, um, it, it, like, for example, the romance, we were just talking about romance when you read other people's romance, but like on the surface, uh, this romance could appear to be delectable, but like very forthright, forced proximity, slow burn, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not that. <laughs> Or the world building. Other than the prologue, you keep the bulk of the story confined to a single location, and our main characters are seemingly on the outskirts of that microcosm. And on the surface, the core conflict, shifters versus wolves, seems simple, yet it isn't mm. at, at all. And uh, or the language and um, and the voice in which you write. It's rich, you know, but you throw in words that I like, I have to look up just to make sure that I do actually know what the proper direct definition is. But like, it's also like blunt and purposeful. And I just, uh, wait, wait, okay, sorry, I do have a question in here. Um, so my, my primary question is, is this just you? And you, you just put it down on the page. It's your voice. It's your rhythm. This, like, this, are you this combination of, like, this delectable contrast of forthright prose of, like, seemingly surface yet intriguingly hidden? Or is this voice something that just developed while you were writing and editing The Last Worlds and then the rest of the legends of wolves? Well, I think I'm a, I think I'm a, first of all, Oh my God, that is so kind. And I, I'm like blushing. Um, uh, but I think that I am, I'm a, basically a very quiet person. And I mostly like to listen. And, and one of my favorite things to do is to look at people who aren't saying anything and figure out what it is that they what is motivating them? Why are they where they are at that moment? And what are they doing with that? I mean, what is the what is the next step in their life? What is the step? What are all the steps that came before? Um, and I think that that that's a game that I play with myself. And I I think it kind of can't help but come out in in writing as well. Um, yeah, so that is you are looking for all those subtle layers, like even in your own life, it's your it is already your mindset, and so that totally comes through. Um, right. I mean, if you take the time and read the book and don't just like gobble it up, which I, which, which I'm a bad gobbler, I gobble the books, you know. <laughs> so so it is that is like when I was. Um, uh, rereading this time, I was taking screenshot after screenshot, and I had to like stop sharing them. I'm like, you have too many screenshots. Stop overwhelming uh, <laughs> your the Discord and all this kind of stuff by sharing the screenshots of like just the little in very sort of like intriguing ways that you're that you put two thoughts together, but it's so subtle. Like it's just, you don't hammer us over the head with it. And I and I I don't know. I just adore that about. We're all different, right? But but uh, but I love that about your writing. Well, one of the, one of the things that I always think is important with writing, you know, everybody writes starts with something else. Like a character is the it should be the main thing that you start with. But I always tend to start with a theme. What is the what is the theme that I want to get across, and what is the character then who can best convey that? So it's you know, but a lot of people and. A lot of the writers that I love the most start with character. And I really admire that, but I, I tend to sort of do a theme. 
that that's how that's how you that's your hook to yeah. the story. Exactly. Yeah, oh, that's a, that's very interesting. It's completely different from the way I write. It's so intriguing. <laughs> it's so intriguing to me. So intriguing. Okay, sorry. Let's let's. We're gonna. Um, actually, none of my questions are particularly soft. Um, but, um, but let's talk about the role. It's me. So let's talk about the role of food in your book because it is so different. Uh, and again, it's one of those contrasts. I'm just going to hopefully, I'm like going to constantly be going on about these, about these contrasts that you weave together so beautifully, but that role of food in your books, you know, this idea of the wolves eat what they kill, but they're veg, but they're vegetarian. Right. And there's all this kind of like very not so subtle sneering at anybody who doesn't, uh, also, um, adhere to that sort of lifestyle and mm. how, how, why, why did you decide that this is how your wolves, uh, how did that come about? Because I mean, it, it's just, it's in the word that they use. They call meat that they have not killed themselves or has not been immediately killed by someone in the pack carrion because it's, old and it's you know it's not it's not fresh they were not they were not there at the at the kill and it feels less maybe they don't like the taste of it as much but it feels less immediate and to me there's i'm trying to emphasize the rawness of their world and the connection of their world with with nature, with their territory. So if you are buying a pork chop in a grocery store, that's why Silver at one point looks at this row of these sort of bleeding pale pink slabs and is appalled by it. She, It just doesn't seem real to her. And so I think there's there is for them that reality and then, so they won't eat what they haven't killed, which ends up meaning that, and they're not, they don't cook meat. That's just not the way wolves work. So they eat vegetarian the rest of the, when they're in skin. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, I, I love that kind of like mythos that you, you know, uh, that you've, that you've created for this world and it so works and it so works. And on multi layers, you know, because of course it's about attitude. It's about, um, it's about, um, connection between, uh, you know, amongst the wolves themselves, how they connect, how they form packs mm -hmm. and all this, and all of the gathering around food, uh, which is, which is, uh, it, you know, I, I love food. I, <laughs> I talk about food all the time. So it's, it's intriguing to me. When, this is a completely different kind of take on it. Um, okay, I'm going to skip a couple of these questions. I'm like, obviously on a tear talking about very specific things, but, but I wanted to talk about, I'm being so serious today. Uh, let's touch back on the romance for a second. Then we'll, then we'll go back into my more serious questions. So Sometimes you come across a romance that is just, it's interesting. You just sort of said this yourself when you were talking about reading, uh, where the, um, the two characters are both a sort of like, I think we ache for them a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and we ache for silver and yet she doesn't. Yeah. And we ache for Tiberius and yet, early on he doesn't and right. there, so like i feel like you set when you set us up you set us as T tiberius represents everything silver thought she could never ever have mm -hmm. like you, and you open us up with this kind of like moment where and i don't know that silver even admits it to herself right off the top of the book that, that he now represents um what what she thought she i mean i don't think she'd even inspired to what to what she eventually has with Tiberius. Um, and and she, she doesn't even, she was originally going to be with, oh my God, now I've forgotten his name. Um, you know, her, this drunkard idiot who was at the end, at the bottom of the pack, that was her original. And she had, she had made her peace with it. Uh, but it was not because that, 
it was all about what self-sacrifice. And this particular sacrifice was what was necessary for the pack. Yeah, it's it, and it's. It, I think she doesn't even know how to, and it's so intriguing. Uh, you know, as we as we build our slow, your slow, we build the slow burn for us. Is that she doesn't even know how to reach for it? Mm-hmm. You know what what Tiberius thinks he's offering, and of course the communication is amazing. Um, but the irony, in contrast, right, to Silver. Obviously, I'm talking about contrast a lot today. Is that early on in Tiberius's attempts at seduction? He's rationalizing. We don't know this until later, right? But he's rationalizing to achieve his goal. And it's not motivated uh, by his heart. So it's like as two characters, there it's so intriguing to me that that Silver is about duty and and um, but also her space and and fulfilling her role. I mean, I know that's duty, but it's, it's a different sensibility that I'm that I'm trying to uh, think about for silver where her where her proper place is and she's been told her entire life where her proper place is in the pack and tiberius shows up and all of a sudden that place could shift right and but and he comes into it thinking only with his head and trying to rationalize all these steps not so not that we're being spoiler we don't want to give any spoilers away but all these steps that he is going to do to achieve his goals and one of them is potentially um seducing silver and yet she doesn't get yeah. seduced, right? Like she doesn't understand seduction, right? And uh, and so, and then also and then as we proceed, we now have that silver represents everything Tiberius has been forced to convince himself that he doesn't want or need. Like right. he, 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 he writes a producer. She is also a producer. Yeah. And so, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I love her because I don't think there's a bone of self-pity in her. No. And I think in that is in, is enormous strength for her. You know, she's, Yeah, and, 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 and this she, is the other, this is the next, the next sort of question I had with talking about this, these contrasts, like, oh, sure, I'll drop this at some point. But that you have this inner versus outer strength that is epitomized with your two characters, right? So you have Silver with all this inner strength and Tiberius with all this outer strength, right? Uh, and that and that this beautiful contrast. And yet it is, of course, not true in the least bit because Silver is powerful mm. and, and, and strong on, on, on the outside as well. And Tiberius himself has to find an inner strength in order to actually embrace what what is what's right in front of him, because uh, right, he he has weaknesses that he's not even aware of yet, that it, that have been essentially trained out of him and been forced out of him until he no longer is who he should be. So, and he hasn't embraced his wolf, right? So we have Silver, who, despite her disability, and I absolutely loved. Uh, that representation in in this piece, um, and I, I will speak to that a little bit on a writer level in a second. But but uh, so we have Silver, who's actually sort of like in, in, uh, embraced her wolf. I mean, she's more wolf than she is human, according to her, according to herself. And then we have Tiberius, who hasn't embraced his wolf at all. And somewhere the two of them have to meet in the middle, and you—you—it's this this beautiful way that you bring us towards that. But speaking towards this disability rap, I absolutely adore um, that Silver has a disability. She's learned to live with it. She, like you said, there's no self pity or anything, and we don't have this kind of like savior prop. Uh, right. You don't bring Tiberius at, um, in as some kind of like savior, and yes he can help a little bit, but she almost refuses that help, you know, because she's like, there's no point. And I, I need to be able to function as a whole. And I always, and I have been functioning as a whole. And it is like silver is such, so refreshing and yet still intriguing. Like we don't need to have so much drama. Right. Uh, You know, part of what's made her as strong as she is, is that when, you know, when the pack was basically saying either she survives or she doesn't, she was like, I am surviving in this little thing, you know, when she was a tiny pup and was left behind by all of her co-evils, she still, 
she still worked it through and she would come back to the pack each and every time, even though it was so hard. Um, and she just, it, it made her the stronger, the stronger character. And in the, you know, in the end, it's something that Evie recognizes when she makes her, Yes, definitely. As the books uh, progress, I mean, Silver's, um, it's hard to actually say that Silver grows because Silver's so amazing right in the beginning, of the, right in the beginning of the book. I think she learns to reach for more things. I think she learns to ask for more and, and, and yeah. understand and, and feel stronger in her position in the pack for sure. And as the books, as the books progress, obviously we see the pack also valuing everything that Silver uh, brings, but like, there's this beautiful brutality about silver, you know, like, it's like, um, she's not some pampered right. princess. I mean, obviously you have characters that come and contrast that later in the books as well. Uh, you know, she's not some pampered princess and it's just, it's, uh, I don't know. There's a whole bunch of delectable things that happen with this, how you slowly bring these two characters together. Um, and, uh, and so much of it is silver. I mean, some people would probably say she's neurodivergent coded a little bit, but I mean, I think this is how your wolves, you know, yes. see, see, see the world, you know? So, but, uh, yeah, I, uh, I absolutely love I mean, what I love about her is that at one point, you know, the sort of the, the warmest, most loving thing she says is if you need me to, I will eat him for you. You know, which is, <laughs> it's so perfect. It's so perfect. This is what I'm saying. But I just feel like um, it's intriguing what you've done with the genre conventions, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and the other thing I was going to say, so now speaking right, very specifically for genre genres, uh, many paranormal stories and romances specifically are a mixture of magic users and that you've chosen in this in, in, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I've read all the books and I've read a couple of them numerous times, but, um, that there's no other magic that you, that you address in the, in this world. And then we're either a wolf or we're a shifter. Uh, and yeah. what, what made you choose to do that? Because in fact, in my mind, it wasn't really about magic because as you know, as, um, I think it's Tiberius says in the second book, in Wolf Apart, when he's uh, talking to Thea, he says uh, that it was no different. The the change, the miracle of the change from a tadpole into a frog, or from a cocoon into a butterfly, or from a, a wolf into a man. Those were at one point accepted as possibilities. So it's less about magic and it's more about possibility about this wonder that exists within the natural world. And I didn't want it to be about, you know, I, I love true blood and I love those books, but at some point you get like, you have like 10,000 different, you've got every kind of fairy and all these other things. And it's actually to me a little bit too much. And it takes away from the theme if you make it too magical and then you get you get these points where you have like um where it's it's just like deus ex machina suddenly snap your fingers and it turns out that there's a fairy character involved and that explains why you're doing what you're doing i didn't want to do that i want to know and it wouldn't have suited these books, you know, ultimately. I mean, I realize now you've written them and you've completed the series right. and, uh, you know, it's easy to say that in hindsight, of course, but, but, uh, but definitely wouldn't have suited, like you said, the theme, the core of, of the world building. We've had Ashton pop on. Ashton, were you coming to talk to us? Just doing a time check with you. You're at uh, the point in your gender where you want to talk about uh, upcoming and what Maria is working on. Oh my God. See, Maria, I knew this was going to happen. I have like this. I still have a list of questions. I know, but I can hear it, but you still have so many questions. But I just wanted to give you the time check just so you had it. And if you want, I mean, if you want to keep going after that too, I mean, you ladies can decide that. But I just wanted to time check. Yeah. Thank it's you. okay. Let's, we won't, uh, we won't, we won't keep Maria fast when we, when we, uh, when we said we will have you back, Maria. And then we'll, oh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do it again. Um, so. Let's, we'll let Ashton uh, control us a little bit more. Um, uh, what are you currently working on? 
Uh, what is your next release? And where is the best place for readers to find you, Maria? Um, okay, so I, I'm I'm in the middle of this writing the first volume of this trilogy. I'm sort of plotting out the trilogy as I write it, and I find that writing a trilogy is much harder than than writing like a series because you have to have an arc for each book and each arc has to be slightly different so that the arc of the whole makes sense. And um, so that's, that's you know, something I'm learning. <laughs> um, and it's about, essentially about the buildup to Ragnarok, but told from the other side because in no way do I believe that a pantheon with four gods of war and, you know, gods of it and places that are thrones of death and all these other kinds of things that cannot be the hero. They are not the ones who are supposed to win. The ones who are supposed to win are on the other side. So I'm doing it from the other side and it sort of ends up, as I said in, in a social media post, it ends up essentially being plants versus zombies. Cause if you know anything about Valhalla, you can get a sense of, of who Odin's army is. So it's zombies. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm working on that and I got interrupted slightly cause I have to, uh, somebody asked me to be part of a anthology. So I'm writing uh, something that's supposed to be 12,000 words and is already 15,000. And I'm, gonna, I'm trying to cut that back. <laughs> So, and as for where to reach me, I have a, a not very intrusive newsletter that comes out when I feel like it. And a, I'm on Instagram probably more than anything else. Your Instagram is the best place. Uh, okay. Um, perfect. Unless I was going to ask you something about your, see, I could just have love, tons of questions I could ask you. Um, so you do plot then rather than pants. I think Deb just flashed this. hundred percent uh... pants. A hundred percent pants. I just, I have a first scene, a last scene, a couple of scenes in behind, in between, a sense of a theme and where I want this to go. And then everything else is a mess. I did for um, Season of the Wolf, which was Evie and Constantine's story. I was told by somebody, again, on social media, the reason you're such a slow writer is because you don't outline. And so I spent like six weeks doing this absolutely amazing, beautiful outline. It was seasons and words and, and you know, plot devices and all sorts of things. It was huge. And I got down to writing and you know this, the characters don't want to do that. You start writing them and they just say, no, nope, not working for me. And I would sort of shove them back like a recalcitrant puppy. And I would shove them back into the outline and they kept saying no. And I ended up having to throw that out because it just didn't work for me. Yeah. I, I, mean, don't try it. It. I think the balance is interesting, right? So it's the, it's the balance for me. Uh, coming from screenwriting, I was all about the plotting for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And I think that I've had to let a lot of that go. Uh, so, so that I understand, I know my tent poles kind of thing and I yeah. kind of work towards those. Um, and then definitely in the last few books I've written, I'm really just trying to not tell myself so much of the story ahead of time. Uh, I, I, I want to discover it so that it's fresh while I'm putting it down on the page. And it seems to be like a kind of a strange balance for me where don't do too much work in order to do the best work. Like it, it's a very strange, because <laughs> in any other um, profession, you wouldn't look at it right like that, right? You would say, yeah. no, 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 you do the all more, this prep. Yeah, right. the more prep you do, the easier it is. And that's just not, it's, I think, I, I don't know of other, maybe music as well is like that, but, um, but writing, it depends on who you are, obviously, but how your brain of, works. Yeah. A lot of people I know that is simply not, not the way to go. So. It's interesting. It's very intriguing to me. And I think we change, you know, the more we write and, and, and shift and stuff. Okay. I'm going to do some official stuff here so I can cut out this loving and then say some, a couple of official things. So, um, Thank you, Maria, for uh, for coming and seeing us on a conversation on hot chocolate. And I do really 
hope you come back because I feel like we just tore through that 45 minutes and I'm not 100% sure we talked about anything um, in a very cohesive manner, which is unfortunate because your books uh, are very cohesive and, and very well written. And so now I feel like I've torn it apart and uh, not in a very uh, um, organized manner. But thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Ashton. And it's wonderful. And uh, next month, uh, we have Jeffy Kennedy with her book, The Dark Wizard, coming uh, to chat about. And hopefully I will be more organized when I, when I have to take her questions. But, you know, probably not. <laughs>